Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first edition of FutureWorks Remote Tech Week. I'm Joanna, and I will be your host for today. Thank you all for being here and for attending the Remote Working Day. First of all, I would also like to thank our partners for, in, for joining us in this event. I would like to thank Camara Municipal de Lisboa, Landing Jobs, Fidzai, OutSystems, and TBLX. And I will also like to thank our speakers for today, Scott Chacun, June Balneo, and Sara Gurjão. Scott is already here with us for our first talk. So thank you so much for being here. And um, to introduce Scott to you, he's the CEO of Chatterbug and previously co-founder of GitHub. He's a software developer, a Git evangelist, speaker, writer, world traveler, father, husband, amongst a lot of other things. He currently works at Chatterbug, the best way to learn a language, and previously helped start GitHub. Today, Scott is here with us to talk about his remote experience because he has been working remotely since back in the day. He once moved to Paris while remote work wasn't a cool thing yet. In this talk, Scott will share how everything was back then and compare it with the days we are going through right now. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. Are you ready for your talk? Uh, of course. First Thanks of for all, having me. I have a little challenge for you, the ice break yeah. moment. Uh, I would like to ask you to take a silly picture with me. Is it okay? Oh, Being a silly uh, face? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Um, are we ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you don't know how to cross your eyes, I recently taught my daughter how to do this. You look at your finger and put it all the way down close and then uh, try to hold it. All right, so everybody's learned something today already. Um, I do have some slides I was going to talk about um, culture at GitHub and specifically around remote work culture and kind of how we thought about it. Um, and then also how I brought that from uh, GitHub to the new company that I started a few years ago, Chatterbug. Um, but I think actually talks are much more interesting if especially online, this is so much easier to do Q&A um, than, than in person. Every time in person, you have to pass the mic around. And it's kind of a pain. Um, online, it actually is very easy to do Q&A. So um, if, you know, I would love to maybe do a slightly shorter talk and then answer questions that anybody has about remote work, about GitHub, about Chatterbug, about uh, my experience, et cetera. I do apologize for the state of my hair. It's been a little bit difficult to get a haircut recently. Um, and, uh, and also if I do particularly bad jokes because there's no, you know, either dead time or laughter to be able to tell whether, uh, I think I'm being funny or not. So, um, <laughs> it could go either way. I apologize to everybody, but I do have some slides, uh, to help me kind of remember what I'm going to talk about. So I'll go ahead and share them. Um, and let's see, hopefully everybody can see that. And, you know, if you want to see more of uh, my face in this beautiful background here, um, you can probably put it into, into a mode where you get a little bit more video. But um, what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about culture, um, specifically GitHub's culture, remote work culture, some of the things that I learned at GitHub. And um, I will go through a short history of GitHub just so you have some idea of kind of how it started and how we came um, to some of these decisions that we did. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, please, um, please do let me know. Um, so short history of GitHub. I um, started at GitHub in 2008, I believe. I was working for um, a company in the Valley. And uh, my friends that I met at a meetup, at a sort of Ruby meetup, um, had this idea for doing this hosted Git service that would be sort of better than anything that was out there. And there wasn't that much out there at the time. And I was really, really super into Git. And so I kind of met them through that. And so we started this, you know, it was sort of a side project at the time and grew it, right? As, as for people that were just working on this sort of side project and started quitting our jobs as it was making more money and grew the business. Um, but it was definitely came from the open source world. And I think that's probably the most important part of what came later because, and especially looking into sort of the remote work experience that, that we, the culture that we built up within GitHub, 
is because we were all open source developers, right? And so I think a lot of people maybe in the audience here um, are open source developers as well or software developers and kind of understand the open source world to some degree. Um, but we were open source developers. And um, as you might know, right, open source is sort of developed by people all over the world. And, and, and we as open source developers were like, why don't we sort of build the business as though it were, we were working on an open source project, but we just so happened to sort of be making money on it. Um, so a lot of the things that we learned about how to organize teams and how to optimize product came from the open source world. Um, and, and that's why there was this big sort of remote version of it from, from a very, from, you know, 2008, right? So for, for a while now. Um, and there's a couple of other companies that we knew at the time that were doing this automatic specifically. We knew Matt um, who was running WordPress and, and they had a very remote uh, work culture for a long time. And so there were things we could kind of learn from people that were doing this professionally, but a lot of this came out of the open source world. Um, and then GitHub grew, right? So it became very popular and, and we started growing. And by the time we had about a hundred employees, we raised um, a round of uh, financing. Um, and so then we kind of got into the VC world and, and, and that even, you know, made it grow faster. Right. So by the time I left, um, I was there for eight years, about eight years. Um, and by the time I left the, when I started at the company, obviously there were four of us, by the time I left, there were uh, somewhere around four to 500 employees, I think. Um, and again, we ran things very much like an open source organization. And if you know something about open source, right, um, there's not a lot of sort of hierarchy and bosses and management and things like that. It's sort of self um, organized a lot, at least for the smaller projects. And we came from that world. And so we, we organized the GitHub that way from the early days. So some fundamental aspects of GitHub culture, right? Um, open source was a big thing as I was saying, right, we came from this open source world. Um, flatness ended up being a big thing, which we also kind of got from this open source world of not having sort of management and hierarchy. Um, and I think that that ended up coming back to, to bite us. And I, I think we learned some lessons there that, that I wouldn't do again. Um, and then remote, right? How do you work remotely? Right? We pulled a lot of these um, concepts of how to organize ourselves remotely from the open source world. So, um, this is a map of everybody that worked on the uh, Django project, actually, but it's just sort of an interesting um, visualization of how a project that is used by lots of people um, is contributed to by lots of people and is contributed to by lots of people all over the world. Um, and this ended up being kind of similar to what GitHub looked like by the time I left. We had 400 employees or so. Um, we had people in almost uh, probably three out of five US states, I think 30 or 35 states in the United States. Um, so we were spread all over the, the US, but then also in probably 20 countries or so um, around the world. Um, and that ended up being sort of a, an administrative problem as well, right? Of just having one employee in one country and then multiplying that by 20 or 30 is, is a huge nightmare. Um, governments don't really like businesses to be set up that way, but um, but that's that's how we were running things, and we really pulled this from the open source world. Um, the other thing was was flatness, like from the open source world. One of the things that you you don't have a lot is this sort of management structure, right? That's not how open source tends to be working. Um, and so we, you know, if you come from a world where you're not used to management, right? If you're coming from this open source world and you're thinking, if I'm going to start my own company, maybe I'll start it in a similar way to how open source works and not kind of these, you know, th this is sort of a, a joke of, of how these companies are structured, um, these famous companies and, and kind of what you want to avoid, right? Um, in, in various manners. And we came from the same place. We wanted to avoid having structures that look like this. And we thought it was kind of inevitable um, but we missed out on, I think, what was really valuable about management and about structure, right, of people knowing who to talk to if they're having problems or people knowing um, where to go if, if they need something um, and to have somebody sort of looking out for them and helping them grow and helping them get, move forward in their career. And so we lost out on all of that because we were just looking at this from a how do we organize work perspective and not the larger concept of how do we help people grow and how do we help people feel safe uh, in an environment. Um, 
And so we did have that flat culture for a while and it took us a really long time to get into a little bit more structure when we found out why we needed it, right? Um, and then finally, this this remote culture. And there were some good, some great parts, and there were some really difficult parts to it. And one of the difficult parts, I think, is is um, nicely summarized by Kent Beck. And this is a tweet that came out a couple of years ago, where uh, some people didn't particularly like the tweet that much, um, but it it illustrated a problem that we had with remote work within GitHub. And part of it came from the fact that we didn't have the entire company working remotely. And so I think that there are probably a couple of big models for remote working uh, within companies. One is very common, which is, well, I guess one would be there's no remote work allowed, right? And so everybody has to come into the office. Um, there's some companies that are, there's some remote work allowed, right? And so if you are special, right, for some reason, um, if you're very, I don't know, important in the community or whatever, or people that the company just really wants to make sure that you're employed and you say, I want to work remotely and they say, oh, okay, nobody really can, but we'll, we'll let you do that. That happens occasionally as well. I saw that um, in lots of companies in, in the Valley where you know, like at Yahoo or whatever, where everybody had to come into work, but a handful of people, some small percentage of the company didn't. Um, and I think that's probably one of the worst examples of remote work, right? When, when there's just a very small percentage, because then no team is really set up to do remote work well. Um, and then there's sort of hybrid models like GitHub, where GitHub was by team. So some teams were almost entirely remote. Our support team, a lot of our engineering team ended up being functionally remote. I think about 70%, 60 or 70% of the team was remote. Um, and when you have that high of a percentage, then essentially the entire team is remote because the team can't function without the infrastructure of remote work, right? Without having a lot of offline communication, without having the office be a chat room, without having everything be written down, right? All of these sort of ten important tenets of remote work. Um, having work be asynchronous, which is which is how you do remote work well. Um, if 60 or 70 percent of the team is remote, then it, essentially the entire team is remote because everybody has to work in these in this asynchronous way, even if they're sitting next to each other. Um, there used to be sort of this joke when when in the early days of GitHub, we would all be kind of sitting around a table and there'd be six of us. Most of us actually lived in San Francisco. And when we got our first office, we would work out of the office a lot. And we'd all be sitting around a table and we'd all be chatting to each other in chat, right? Because even though we were sitting next to each other, it was important to us as developers um, on one hand that we're not interrupted all the time. So we can get into the zone and kind of move um, at our own pace and then come into chat and then see what questions have been answered, even if they're sitting right next to us and not be interrupted. Um, sort of sort of synchronously interrupted, right? Um, and so we really we really worked that way. But as the company grew, um, and then sorry, and then the last sort of type of company that does remote work is one are ones that are 100% remote, where every every employee works remotely. Um, and I think that works well too. But I, I don't know that there's a huge difference between 100% remote and sort of having you know hubs or or HQs or something. Um, as long as there's a, there's a large enough percentage that it forces the whole team to work effectively remotely. Um, and, and so I'll, work, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we use that and embrace that in Chatterbug in my new company now, but um, at the time we kind of stumbled into this somewhat accidentally because we were hiring all of these people that we thought were the best people and they happened to be living all over the United States and we were open source developers and so we just organized our work as open source and it ended up working out fairly well, right? All of that work has to be done asynchronously the same way that that any remote work is done, right? Um, but this is kind of what ended up becoming a problem because some teams were remote and some teams were not. And if you're not remote or if you're on a team that is not working remotely um, and you, you don't have a full view into what everybody's doing, then what you end up getting is a partial view into what people are doing and you start assuming the worst, right? And I think this tweet is probably a pretty good example of this. Uh, we saw this a lot at GitHub as well, where you know somebody would decide, okay, well, I can work from wherever, whenever I want to. So I'm gonna work from Tahoe and I'm gonna ski during the day, I'm gonna work during the night and somebody can put in hours and be really productive. But if in, everybody just sees them sort of Instagramming, you know, skiing in the middle of the day, then everybody assumes that they're on vacation and they're not really taking things seriously. 
Um, and so it's a lot, there's a lot of perception management that's sort of evolved with remote work if people know everybody else and don't have a good concept into what work they're getting done, right? Uh, and care about when they're getting the work done where the rest of the team doesn't. Um, and so, <clears throat> so that, that was a big part of our issues with remote work, I think, was having teams that were not working remotely or not having insight into how other teams operated. Um, and trying to avoid that ended up being a big problem. Um, one of the other things that, that kind of came up a lot that, that was problematic is, is trying to avoid um, uh, having people, uh, actually, let me, let me move on. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is, is try to make sure that your team is operating as a remote team or your team is not operating as a remote team, but make that distinction and try to figure out uh, what are we, right? And, and embrace the, the principles around that because if you do it halfway, then it's, it's worse for everybody. Um, and this was actually one of the things that, that, that we also valued sort of in the culture at GitHub um, and why I put this on the slide as well is, is um, this idea of approaching problems from first principles, right? Um, and this was a phrase that we used within GitHub a lot to talk about the why of, of um, what we, what we, why we did something. Um, and one of the ways that you can think about first principles, and I think this is valuable, um, whether you're applying it to remote work or how your team works or product design or, you know, anything, any, anything within your company really, um, is if it doesn't seem to make sense or if it doesn't seem like it's working, then a valuable thing to do is approach the problem from first principles, which is the thing that, that GitHub really liked to do a lot, which is, to ask what is the fundamental thing that we're trying to, to solve and does this way of approaching the problem solve it, right? So are we trying, like, why are you doing remote work? Like in this case, uh, in sort of, you know, coronavirus times, it's kind of obvious why a lot of companies are doing remote work because there's value to not having people sitting right next to each other, right? Um, when hopefully at some point we'll be out of this or before this, the, the point of remote work was not to not have people in physical you know, proximity to each other. Um, and so if that's your, that, if that's the main reason that you're doing remote work now, then think about that as a first principle, right? Are there other ways of having people work together? Um, in, I don't know, in person or whatever, that as long as they, they don't have physical proximity in a way that's dangerous um, or whatever, if that's what your first principle is, then remember that as a first principle, not sort of what the outcome is, right? Um, if, however, your first principle is the, the problem that you're really trying to solve is I want, you know, I want my employees or I want the people in my company to have more autonomy about when they work and where they work, right? Which there's a lot of value to that. There's, there's, you can hire people from all over the world if, if you do it well, right? Or um, your employees, even if they're in the same city, can have more um, autonomy about when to start working and end working when to pick up their kids from school or you know when to, to to be able to to change their schedule around other factors in their life um as long as they get the work done right having that autonomy is very valuable so um what's i think very valuable is not to say we should do remote work because it's a good thing but to say what are we trying to solve with remote work and think about that problem set by itself and then ask yourself, does remote working solve that problem, right? And I feel like that's not actually done enough when we're talking about business principles or you know, how to run a business or um, you know, any, any of these, these sort of talks about how, how to run a company or how to structure something. I think a lot of times it's really valuable to take a step back and say, what is the problem that we're really trying to solve with this? And is this the best way of doing it, right? Um, so, this is, this is what GitHub looked like from more or less in the very, very early days when there were just a handful of us. Um, and as we grew, right, these are, these are sort of um, summits that we would do as we went. And this is right before I, or right after I left. Um, this is what the size of the company is. But what's interesting is that when you, when you decide, right, we're going to be a remote working company and you start talking about how are we going to operate and how are we going to run, it's interesting to think about, you know, when your company gets sort of to a size like this, what do you think that will continue working and what won't work at that point? Um, because whatever works for a company of this size, you know, it doesn't necessarily work for a company of this size, but there are lessons that I think you can take from that. Um, okay, so 
I, about four years ago, uh, um, I left GitHub and I started a new company called Chatterbug. And what is interesting is thinking about, as I started this new company, thinking about what are the things that I'm going to take with me and re-implement, uh, the stuff we did at GitHub that I want to do again in a new company, and what are the things that I didn't, right, that, that I did differently with the new company. And I think this is actually a valuable lesson to, to apply at any point, right? If you left the company you were at and you started your own company from scratch, what are the things that you think are really valuable um, and what are the things that you would leave behind or change, right? And, and I think that's actually a valuable sort of mental game, mental exercise to do um, every once in a while, right? To just get an idea of what is valuable to you in the, in the way that you're structuring your, your work. Um, so this is my, this is uh, Chatterbug in the early days. It has also started growing. We have about 40 employees now. And there's a lot of things that, that I have taken from GitHub and tried to re-implement in Chatterbug. And one of them is interesting around this idea of remote work um, because remote work at Chatterbug is a little bit different. One of the down, some of the downsides of remote work that became very problematic and will be problematic if you're, in a, if you're working remotely um, or if you're in a place working remotely. And I think some, place, some places are starting to see this with coronavirus, but um, in a more acute way, I think, because nobody's really able to get to spend much time outside of their house or around other people. But even when you're working remotely um, in a company in normal times, um, one of the larger problems that we had at GitHub is, is employees feeling isolated, right? And so one of the really valuable things, I think, is to try to make sure, try to come up with ways to not feel isolated if you're an employee or if you are an employer, right? If you're structuring this, this work, um, to try to come up with ways to make sure that your employees don't get burnt out or don't feel um, don't feel disconnected um, from the the community that they're in, whether it's a software development community or something, um, and from their coworkers. Um, and if they're not in the office, that is one of the nice things about having an office, right? Is having biob and or or I guess this isn't really a German audience having like a like Friday drinks sort of deal, right? Where you can sit around and hang out with your friends and have a beer and kind of get to know each other. Um, and if you're missing that in a remote work environment, it's very difficult to do that type of thing. And, and I think that there's a downside to that, right? To being able to grab a beer with your coworkers after, after work. Um, so you, you kind of have to figure out how to deal with that. What we ended up doing, but there's a ton of, of huge advantages to remote work, right? It, it, like I was saying about being able to structure your day and being able to work more flexibly when you work and how you work and where you work. Um, people need different environments. Um, people need different schedules from time to time. Um, we have people who will, you know, travel home to, we have a lot of, of people from all over the world in the company and they'll travel home to South America, they'll travel home to, uh, to, to Spain or something, right? And spend time with their family for a couple of months during the winter sometimes. And, and so having that flexibility, I think is incredibly important and it's, it's a great thing to, to have. Um, but also having a physical space is nice in other ways, right? And so we didn't go the route of, for the new company of having the company be 100% remote. We, we have hubs, right? We try to get people that live in Berlin um, to, to hire people that live in Berlin so that, you know, when we want to get together, we can, but when we had to lock down the office and nobody could come in, you know, we've still structured in, from an information standpoint, from a, how we communicate, from a, how we organize our work, everything's online, everything has a URL, uh, everything is asynchronous. Um, and then we just have meetings, you know, very occasionally when we think that there's something that's going to be much more efficient to do real time in person. Right. Um, and so switching to everybody working from home wasn't really that big of a problem um, in, the, in the overall scheme of things. We were already set up to do that fairly well at Chatterbug. Um, but I didn't go the route of starting a new company and saying everybody's going to work from everywhere in the world. Um, I, I, I do feel like there's a lot of value in getting people together. And it's a difficult problem to solve if you can't, right? And so I kind of went down the route of we set up the company to work, be able to work remotely, but I'm going to try to get as many people as possible in these hubs in San Francisco and in Berlin. Um, so also how to how to hierarchy, right? And this is this is another thing that we learned from GitHub of not trying to have this sort of flat environment, but to have everybody have somebody that they report to and only one person that they report to, right? That is responsible for their movement in the company, for them, their professional um, uh, 
you know, working on themselves professionally, where they want to go, where they want to get to, um, skill sets that they'd like to, to improve, et cetera, career progression. Um, and then also if they have a problem with the company or if they have a problem somehow that they know who to talk to about it, right? Um, and we didn't have that at, at GitHub and it became very problematic. And so that was something that we brought over into this new company as well of, of saying, everybody should know exactly the one person that they're, they're reporting to and have one on, weekly one-on-ones with them and make sure that that is, that is part of the structure from, from the first employees. Um, uh, how to empathy, th this is sort of another thing that goes along with, with um, diversity, right? Empathy and diversity. Um, one of the interesting things that we did at, at, at GitHub, and this just sort of came out of the, the product that we were building, right? Is that we were a lot of, we were a bunch of young dudes in San Francisco and we hired a lot of other young dudes in San Francisco and that kind of ended up becoming um, the majority of the company um, for a long, long time, right? Um, and in, in Chatterbug, I think we've been able to both approach that more consciously to make sure that, you know, are we hiring a more diverse um, and empathetic workforce, but also it was a little bit easier for Chatterbug a to some degree as well, because we're hiring um, a lot of teachers, right? We're, we're developing curriculum for learning languages online. Um, we're trying to develop sort of an online school. And so we hire a lot of teachers. And if you hire a lot of teachers and software people and marketing people, that ends up in Berlin, right? Where people are from all different backgrounds to begin with. Um, you end up kind of, even if you're on purpose, not, not on purpose trying to build a diverse workforce, you, you tend to, right? And so we have a much more diverse workforce from the beginning. And I think that that's been um, very valuable. But also, I think from the standpoint of, of diversity and empathy, it is really valuable to have these remote work aspects in built into your company because um, it allows for people that have children or it allows for people that have alternative schedules or something to be able to work for you in, in, a, value, in, a, in a useful way, right, without stressing them out that much. Um, and, and so that allows you, I think, to, to be able to make more diverse choices as you're hiring. So I'll just kind of end by talking a little bit about what it takes, right, to, to have a really valuable um, uh, remote workforce. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I think I've gone over it a couple of times. So you want to be able, you want to write things down, right? You want to make sure everything has a URL. You want to structure everything so that you can work um, asynchronously. And right? if you have chat or something, don't ping somebody and then expect them to, to be on it in five seconds, right? Like come up with a culture of being able to work asynchronously. Um, and I think it really helps you build up this remote workforce that 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 is super valuable. Okay, so I saw uh, somebody come in to do q and I think. Um, maybe we can, I think I've, I'm, coming a little bit up on my time here. Um, yes, so maybe fine. we can switch over to uh, answering some questions. We have actually here some questions that people are doing in slides though. I will start with the ones that have the most thumbs up, okay? Sure. So the first question for you is, GitHub at people working in the office and remotely. How did you overcome those barriers and obstacles? Um, so it's a good question. How do we overcome the, the obstacles of people working remotely? So it depended on, on the person, right? As the company got bigger, we had a lot of people that were working remotely that had never worked remotely before. And so that was problematic where we would have handbooks. Um, actually, uh, I know I'm coming from GitHub, but GitLab has like a remote working handbook that's actually a pretty good starting point of, of a lot of these, these points, right? If, if you're new to remote work, they have good um, pointers, I think, in there for um, people setting up a remote workforce and people working remotely um, by themselves the first time. But internally to GitHub, that's that's what we essentially had to do was teach people, uh, if this is the first time you're working remotely, here are the things to do, right? Go out and find yourself a community or do Zoom calls or whatever with people in your in your um, in your team and have virtual beers or something, you know, every once in a while or come up with some way of, of making sure you're surrounded by a community because otherwise you're going to start feeling isolated very quickly. Um, and also trying to break people of the habit of, of synchronously interrupting people of saying like, I need, you know, if, if you're in core work hours and I ping you, I want a response within five minutes or within, you know, a minute or whatever. I think that's really disruptive and difficult um, to try to get into the space where, you know, you don't, any, any, communication, you throw it out there and the, the mentality is, 
they'll get I'll get back to it when they get back to me, and that could be at any time, right? And I think that that's that's a really valuable way to, of starting to build that up. Um, and then, you know, from a team standpoint, we we would just kind of um, try to make sure that the team was remote or it was not remote, um, and and to not have something sort of in between because when it's unclear whether you're a remote team or not, then it causes confusion and it causes stress for people. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. We received a lot of questions in the last minutes. Um, we have here one question that asks, what would be the pros and cons of adopting a full remote culture versus a partial remote culture, like two or three days per week? Um, so, I mean, if it's, if it's two or three days per week, then it means it still means that everybody has to live in the same place, right? Because they have to be able to, to come in. And so if it's going to be that, then it might as well be, you know, work from home whenever you want, because you're still going to have to set up um, ways of working remotely, but you don't really get a lot of the benefits of, of, you know, having remote work. If it's a fully remote workforce, right, where you're just hiring people in different countries and different cities and stuff, um, then the downsides are that you can't really get in person, right? And I think a lot of us are seeing the downsides of that now, right? If, if you're working 100% remotely for the first time with your whole team working 100% remotely for the first time, it's really, really difficult on people. Um, it's difficult mentally, like it's difficult. And that happens. Like we had people at GitHub who would be sort of, they, they would really like it for the first month and then really start getting stressed out after that. Um, and I think a, a lot of people are feeling that right now, right? Of, of thinking it's kind of cool for maybe a week or two and then being like, okay, I really want to see people now. Like I, I, I want to, you know, have a meeting or be around coworkers or whatever. Um, and that happens at any time that, that happened with GitHub constantly. Um, and so what we did actually to, to combat that is we would do summits, right? So we would every three months or every six months or something, we would fly the entire ops team or whatever team into like one house in California or Maine or something um, and have them like live in a house for three or four days together and like get to know each other and do long-term planning and then and then they'd all fly home and then implement everything. Um, but that ends up being difficult and expensive for people and for the company. And so, you know, I, I found that having this, this, you know, trying to get everybody sort of in, in a hub city or in hub cities and then saying work whenever and wherever you want, but trying to build an office space that is conducive to good work, right? So that people would prefer to work at the office than at home. Um, then that's, I think, the best of, of sort of those worlds where you have the flexibility, but you also have the camaraderie. Um, and, and it's not expensive to get everybody in a room together when you actually do need to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have here another question. This is a pretty interesting one. How does the company overcome trust issues with the employees working remotely? Um, so that's a good question. It, it was very difficult. I don't know that we really ever 100% solved it at, at GitHub, right? Um, we stopped <clears throat> encouraging people. We used to kind of encourage people to, we would put people's Twitter streams up on monitors and stuff. And, and so you could kind of see what everybody was doing. And, and we kind of um, try to discourage that a little bit more, right? Like if you, if you can't, if you don't know that person, don't get mad at, at them skiing or whatever that week, like just assume that they're doing a good job, right? Or ask their manager or whatever, if, if you really have a problem with that, because usually their manager's like, who gives a shit? Like they're, you know, they're doing lots of work, it's fine. Um, and, and again, if you have a hierarchy, then that's great. If you don't have a hierarchy, then it's just everybody kind of, you know, bad mouthing each other behind their back. And that, that, that was part of the reason why the hierarchy thing became a problem at GitHub is because people wouldn't know the person personally, they wouldn't really know their work, um, and then they would get mad at them for some reason, right? And then be like, they're not doing anything. And they, they had no real basis for that. Um, and so I think part of it is getting to know employees better, right? Um, and then part of it is knowing, having, making sure that there's somebody on the team that knows, is this person doing good work or not? And then making sure that that is the person that you ask, right? If, if is this person doing good work or not? And the employee actually on that side, this is also why management is really valuable. Um, in this in this degree, because if you're working remotely, you do end up having that problem, right? Of, am I doing enough? Am I getting 
am I meeting expectations of the company? And if you don't have a manager, then it's impossible to know that, right? Like you don't really know who's making that determination. If you do, then you can just ask your manager like every time, right? Like, am I meeting the, 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 what the company expects me to do, right? And if you are, then it's great. And you have security that way and you can, you don't get stressed out. Um, if you don't, and you're just wondering who's talking about you behind your back, then it's, it's much more difficult. Um, so that is one of the things that makes management so valuable, I think in a remote workforce is to make sure that as an employee, you have this touch point where you can say like, is the company happy with me? Like, and, and then also, am I happy with the company and, and here are the issues that I have with this and then you can help work on them with somebody. Um, and, and I think having that single touch point is really, is really valuable and, and even more important in a remote company. Nice. Uh, next, next question. I think you already answered some of it, but I don't know if you want to add something. The question is, what were the specific disadvantage of the flight structure in GitHub? Uh, yeah, so I mean the advantages of of the of the flexible structure of the remote workforce. You mean, um, <clears throat> it was that we could get uh, we could make incredible hires, right? Um, I think for the technical side that that ended up, and for support, um, the other thing was we could make great hires, and then also we had people all over the world. So for ops and support, that was really valuable because we had people in every time zone. So there was always somebody awake, right? And we had these sort of rotating teams. And so having a remote workforce, if, if you know, if you have a, a system that has enough users where you need to be online 24 hours, right? It's really nice to have people in support and people in ops and people in engineering that there's always somebody awake, right? And, and so just the distribution by itself, I think it has, has value to it. Um, the, the being able to hire anybody aspect, I think really helps with diversity, right? It helps, it helps finding people that, that are not just like you, um, but also making great hires, right? Um, so we, we would hire people from the very, very senior people at, at large companies when we were quite small um, because we were building something cool, but also because we didn't make them move, right? And so, they could stay where they were. They didn't have to go into the office every day. You know, maybe they were doing an hour commute to, to the Microsoft campus or whatever, and they didn't want to do that anymore. And so we could be like, okay, we have a great thing to work on. You can just do it from home. And, you know, we'll still, we'll pay the, we'll pay. Sometimes we would even cut salaries. Like they would make less coming to work for us, but it was just so much more flexible. There's a lot of value in that, right? And so we could get super senior people um, and we could get them anywhere in the world. And so we, we just had this massive, uh, community to pick from, to hire from. And, and if you are only hiring where somebody has to be at a desk, um, a, a lot of times also just from the flex personal flexibility, there was, there was a big deal for employees, right? Because it was a big selling point to, to come work for us instead, because we had this, this flexibility where, um, we had people who were married to professors, right? And so they would have to move universities every once in a while. And they had very little choice about where they could go. And they had to physically be there. And so as a spouse, right, if you can move with them and it doesn't really matter, then that takes a huge amount of pressure off of, of the, the sort of family decision making, um, et cetera, right? There's, there's a ton of this, uh, of these things, of, of this flexibility. But I think we found it ultimately very valuable. It was just, it took us a while to figure out how to manage it well. Okay, nice. Uh, another question. How does Chatterbug do to avoid getting its employees disconnected? Um, it's a good question. So I think historically, you know, before coronavirus, we, we, again, we have a HQ, we have like an office space. And so everybody would be in the office space, not every day, not all the time, but when people started feeling, you know what, I'm feeling disconnected. I feel like I, I would like to be around coworkers. Um, you could go in, right. You could go in and spend time in the office and, and it's, it's relatively easy to do that if you're in the area. Or we have people that live um, in other countries, right? And we could fly them in relatively easily and have them spend a week here or something and then go back. And so that, that ended up, I think, ha has ended up working out really well. In the last month, right, as people can't come into the office, it's been a little bit more difficult. Um, I mean, we still meet online every week. Um, so the whole company gets together for a video all hands, you know, on Zoom. So we do that every single week. Um, we do online events um, to, and try to get people to to involve themselves, to come in and ask questions and stuff. We do like a, a live segment of, of German language learning 
we have for the past several weeks and we try to get everybody in the company to join and ask questions and play along and stuff, right? It helps. Um, <clears throat> we've started doing a thing where it's like a skill share. So everybody will sign up and then teach the whole company something. And then everybody kind of joins the Zoom thing and they teach, you know, how to, I don't know, how to make pasta or something like that, right? And so we do, we also try to have the, these um, sort of personal things. And, and all of this is, we're kind of shooting from the hip in the last couple of weeks of just being like, okay, people people want to spend a little bit of time around their, their coworkers that's not just in Slack, um, you know, asking questions or something. Um, but I think historically, again, like we would try to get people in person together, if it's a, a heavily remote team, to spend some time in person um, some way, I think is very is very important. It's just a question of how often do you do that? Is it every month? Is it every week? Is it every quarter? Right? Is it once a year? These are pretty cool initiatives. I think I'm taking some of them to, to our team as well. Uh, I think we can go to, to the last question. How do you enhance people productivity through remote working? Um, how do we enhance people's productivity? So I think I think actually one of the things that you have to set up when you set up a, a team for working remotely is being very good about saying, here's what we expect from you as, as an employee, right? for the next week, right? And then you meet with your manager, whatever, and you say, okay, here's what I wanna work on. And then they say, that sounds good, that, you know, here are the goals. And you say, okay, I think I'm gonna be able to, to do this amount of work in the next week. And then you can go off and have total autonomy and do it however you want. You can do it all, you know, in one 48 hour sprint and then sleep and drink for the next four days. And the next Monday, if you show up and it's like, I did all this stuff, who cares, right? Like who cares how you did it? Like I, I, as an employer, as a coworker, I shouldn't really care how, how that got done. I mean, there, there are some, like if you're an ops or whatever, then, you know, you have to be around in case the site goes down or like there's pager duties and things like that. So it's, it's not always the same, you know, for every, every job, but just theoretically, right? It shouldn't really matter how you're getting the work done or where you're getting the work done from, as long as you're sitting down and saying, here's my, my goal is, and then you're meeting the goals or you're not meeting the goals um, and, and don't care about anything else, right? And, and I think that getting into that mindset, even if you're coming into the office every day is actually kind of a nice thing to do, right? If you wanna, if you're like, you know what, I'm not feeling productive today, I'd rather just go to the park and sit there and have a Zen moment or whatever. Maybe you'll have a good idea. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll end up being more productive that way but feeling like if I leave the office, people are going to notice and, I, and they're going to think I'm not getting work done, right? Moving to the mindset of I check in every Monday, we say, here's what's expected. I deliver what's expected. And that's, you know, and, and I can work on with people on that and, and just having that be the expectation and not physical presence, I think is, is massively helpful in lots of different ways. Um, and whether you're coming in the office or whether you're working remotely or, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think that's just a valuable thing to do. Nice, thank you. Uh, I think we still have time for one more question and I think this is a good one. Uh, do you have a plan or a routine to manage a team that is spread across different time zones? <clears throat> no, I mean, there's not, there's not. So what I've seen a lot of companies do, it depends on how many time zones we're talking about, right? So what I've seen a lot of companies do that are, that are highly distributed and is have core hours, right? So you'll say like, here's a set of three or four hours um, that, that are, everybody should be online at some point so that if there's a question that we can have a slightly faster sort of back and forth with it, uh, doesn't have to be immediate, but it's nice to have people having some overlap in when people are working. So um, I used to travel back and forth from San Francisco to Berlin very often, a couple times a month. And, and when I was in San Francisco, my day would be from like five in the morning until, um, you know, until, I don't know, eight hours after that or whatever, until the afternoon. Um, and then I'd spend time with my kids after that, um, which is kind of nice because then I can, you know, I, I'm essentially off work at 3 p.m. and then I can spend time with the kids after that. And, and, and so my, my day actually ends up being structured very nicely. In Berlin, it's the opposite. I, I wake up at 10 in the morning, right? And, and, I, and I work, my whole day is shifted like five hours. And it's kind of nice because there's a nine hour time zone difference. And so it makes it so that in actuality, the, the day is only shifted by four hours when I, when I travel. Um, but having like core hours and saying, okay, here's two hours or four hours that, you know, try to be online at that point, that's really going to help people coordinate. Um, and if you're not, then, then outside of that, you know, work whenever you want to or whatever. Um, sometimes that 
that works really well for, for coordinating on time zones as well. Um, but, and then uh, we, we used to have ops teams where we'd have people in every time zone and, you know, it's very hard to have sort of team meetings at that point because there's no time that's good for everybody. Um, and so they would rotate times, right? And so you'd have like one month, it'd, it'd be one o'clock for somebody. And then the next month it'd be, you know, one o'clock for somebody else, right? Like, and, and it'd just shift three hours every month or something. Um, and so, yeah, it depends on how many time zones. We have, we have California and Berlin, um, and then a couple of people in between. And so there's only nine hour range there. And so we can kind of find, even all hands meetings are kind of, a diff, you know, we, we, we end up doing it 6 p.m. here, which is kind of late and like nine in the morning there, which is a little bit early, but it, it works out okay. If we added people in Tokyo, it'd probably be difficult and we'd have to figure out something else. Um, at GitHub, what we ended up doing for those types of things is recording them. So every meeting we would try to do on Zoom or we didn't have Zoom at the time, but we did blue jeans, I think mostly then. Um, and we would record everything and we put every, all the all hands meetings, any important meetings, and we put everything online and we had like an internal video sort of um, uh, service, right, where you could search for old meetings and watch old meetings and take notes and things like that. And so we just we made meetings offline as well. Like if you could be there in person, then that's great. If you couldn't, then you could watch it later. And, and I think that that's really valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing your experience with us. I think it was great. Uh, I really enjoyed be also being here with you. Um, I would like to, to thank you for coming. You can now exit. Uh, we are now going to a break sponsored by OutSystems, and I hope to see you all here at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I will send some questions to Scott during our first talk. If you want to ask questions to John, please don't forget to write them. I don't know if you have a but I will ask them in the end of the talk. Our second talk, we have John Bonnie with us. She's the globalization lead at Remote. John is a Catholic from Courtney and has a remote for the eight years and the past world. He's currently the globalization lead for Remote and Nonprofit Organization, whose mission is to make remote work accessible to locals. She's also the co founder of Remote and the remote is training for companies and individuals on how to work remotely. Hi, I hope everybody can hear me. All good? Okay. I should go ahead and share my screen, All right? Thank you so much for the introduction, Joanna. Thank you. Um, can we have our silly picture? It's our Oh yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yes. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. All right. Go ahead, the stage is yours. Okay, let's go. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And... See, oops, present. Here we go. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever, which part of the world you are watching the, the live today. Um, so today we'll be talking about how to manage remote teams. And this is a very interesting topic for us. So first of all, uh, I would like to introduce myself just as want to mention I my name is June I'm very friendly most of the time uh, I've been working remotely for almost eight years now uh, I've been managing remote teams from all over the globe um, I am also the globalization lead for grow remote I am the co-founder for work remote and I am a big remote work advocate um, and I want remote work to be accessible and uh, available for everybody who needs and wants to go, you know, remote. And let me just, uh, first of all, I, I want to just give a brief overview of what remote working is, um, just so, to make sure that we are all on the same page before we continue with the, with the management part. So what is remote work? Right, so remote work is a working style that allows professionals to work outside of the traditional office environment. And remote working, uh, we've, just to simplify it, because it's very broad, we've categorized them into three different types, right? You have the remote employee, which is people who are employed by a company, but they are not going to the office. They work from home by default. And you have the freelancers and contractors. These are the people who are working part-time um, in the per project or per task. And then you have the entrepreneurs. These could be uh, people who have online businesses or they themselves own the company. Like there are startup founders, for example. And um, yes, this is just the explanation of of what I just said, <laughs> employed individuals who are working for companies full time. Um, and then for freelancers or individual contractors who work per project, per task, or per hour. And then we have the entrepreneurs, which is uh, people who have their own products and services that they want to sell online. This could also be like your own startup company, right? So remote, remote can actually be for almost everybody. So what are the main challenges of a remote manager? Uh, we've, we always talk about the challenges of being a remote worker, but the challenges of a remote manager is slightly different from the, uh, the remote worker side because we actually have a, we have a big responsibility, bigger responsibility 
to keep things together and make remote work. It's a two-way street. Uh, even if you have a remote worker who knows how to work remotely, if you don't know how to manage these people, this, te this team, chances of it being successful is kind of slim. And so we need to make sure that both the workers or the team members and the managers are educated about remote working. So these are the, you know, the struggles that most remote managers are facing. Communication, connection, and trust. And it's arranged this way because if you have good, good communication, most likely you will have good connection with your team. And when you have a good connection with your team, you will be able to build trust with them. Now, communication. So communication, we've broken it down to asynchronous communication. This might not work for everybody, but this is what's recommended. Asynchronous communication, meaning that you don't have to be there all the time or it's not instantaneous. You're not there monitoring everybody like, uh, you know, CCTV where it's like, you know, every task that they're doing, it doesn't necessarily have to be that or they don't need to like answer you real time or you answer to them real time. Asynchronous communication means that it can be, uh, maybe they will send you a message in the morning and you will reply to them in the afternoon. So for this to work, communication for this to work, you need to have a lot of trust in there. But basically asynchronous communication is advantageous for you to be flexible. It means that as long as you have the tasks clearly defined, um, it doesn't matter if they reply to you, in, you know, right that second or a few minutes or a few hours from then. So, you know, asynchronous communication means that you have you have successfully implemented uh, remote working into your team. Have a single source of truth. So, most distributed teams have what they call uh, guidelines or a handbook, so to speak. Uh, GitLab is a really good example. They have their GitLab handbook, which is most most of the companies now who wants to go distributed, they kind of refer to these handbooks and, and look at them as a single source of truth, meaning that all of your processes, the way you communicate, the way that you do certain tasks, who do you talk to, your mission, your vision, the values of your company, it's all in one place and everybody in your company are able to um, access it, right? Clear and transparent processes means that if you assign a task to somebody, they know exactly how to do it. And it's documented also in your single source of truth, right? So for example, they need to change uh, a feature in, in your product or whatever. Uh, how, how are they going to make that change? There, there should be a clear process. Who makes the change or does the, requ does the request? who approves it and who pushes it to live, but those sorts of things, the little details, just to make sure that all of the, the steps that needs to be taken for something to happen is, is documented and accounted for and everybody knows what they are supposed to do. And then results-oriented conversations. This is something very interesting because um, most of the time in in-person situations, we just start conversations just to start conversations, right? However, in remote uh, setup, you need to be intentional. Why are you initiating a meeting with that person? So you need to have a result right after the meeting. Like, well, let's go, let's hop on a call or let's do a one-on-one -on -one meeting. But every time that you start a conversation with somebody, especially if it's a, it's a synchronous conversation, it needs to have a purpose, an intent, and a result right after uh, for, it, you know, for it to be effective. And then have open conversations, keeping in mind that not everyone will agree on something. And this means that there are instances, the, the saying, let's agree to disagree, right? So for you to have this open, uh, environment or open culture within your company that people can say, you know, to a certain degree and also with respect to everybody, 
what their opinions are and that the, the rest of the group respects their opinion and considers it, you know, not necessarily accepting it, but, or, or taking that into account, like this is going to be the decision, but for them to consider the, the conversation or the opinion of others without backlash. And that. So that's for communication. Connection. Now, if you have well, you know, if you have good communication established within your team, connection is going to be very easy. The connection within remote teams are more intentional than you would with um, in-person teams because you don't have those uh, pantry talks, you know, like meeting before you go in or go out of the bathroom, those, those tiny encounters that you would normally have when you are in the same office. In remote work setup, almost all of the interactions that you will have are intentional. So you need, you as a manager, you have a big responsibility to initiate these connections, meaning that you should schedule your one-on-one -on -one meetings. You should schedule your team meetings to get a pulse. You know, With the one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's for you to talk with your team on a personal level. How are you? How are things with your work? How are things with your family? You need to be uh, to care enough to know how are they and what are they going through and how can you make their work easier now it's not necessarily all just going to be about their tasks it could be something to do with you know the, the weather or where they are or something silly like how's your dog or whatever but but basically this one-on-one -on -one meetings are reserved for you and your team members so that you can still have that bonding regardless if you're not in the same office, same physical space. Now the team meetings are basically to get the pulse of how is the team? How are you working together? You need to have that bonding moment with them and also for them to be able to work together uh, synchronously. And this is something that has to be led by someone it could be you, with, which is the manager of the team, or you can also give um, the host, uh, or you can assign different people every time you, di di uh, different people to host the meetings every time, right? So you can do the round robin. And this encourages others within the team to take responsibility and also to become the star of the team, you know, every once in a while. And like I said, it, 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 there's a lot of responsibility when it comes to you as a manager because um, you will have to empower your team to be able to do this. The all hands meeting, especially if you're a founder or a CEO, if you're in an executive level, all hands meetings are important because this is the time that you'll be able to address everybody in your company. Let's say you are like GitLab or this. 1,200 people in your company already. For you to uh, for you to communicate what's the update of the company, where are you going, where are you at, if there's anything worth celebrating, the all hands meeting is where you can communicate that to them. The water cooler breaks is also important. Um, this is what replaces the pantry conversations. Like if you want to send anything, under the sun, you just want to share an event, for example, if you want to share your a photo of your dog or what you did for the weekend or anything that you would like to, to share within your, within your team or within your company. It's important for us to have that place or that uh, platform medium for, that you can still connect with other people um, that will replace those um, informal conversations that you have in, in the office. Virtual team activities is also very interesting. It's like, um, especially if you're a smaller team, this could be fun. Um, we um, suggest doing uh, team yoga in the morning, like you do 10 minutes and everybody in the team could participate, or you can do quizzes and, and uh, game shows or whatnot. We encourage them to do all of these so that you can keep that bonding within the team. Uh, but as a manager, it's 
you know, it, it, it's like you need to take initiative to be able to do this or assign somebody in your team to, um, to, to do this. And then physical meetings, even the biggest distributed teams out there, uh, although they are located in several countries, they still make an effort to meet in person every once in a while, right? It could be uh, an entire company meeting for uh, a conference or you know, a, certain, a company event. Everybody goes to the same location and the, the company sponsors them. Or it could be a team meeting where you know, just the design team or the development team, engineering team, they would go and meet together so that they can work physically together. Going remote doesn't necessarily mean that you will be completely isolated. What we want to communicate is that going remote gives you the flexibility and the independence to choose whether you want to work physically in the office or if you want to work virtually from home. So it's important for us to keep that in mind, especially during the pandemic, because many people might think that this is normal. This is not normal, even for remote workers. We don't normally coop up within the house. Like personally, I go to libraries and other remote workers, they go to co-working spaces or they go to cafes and they co-work with other people. So this is not normal. Remote work is not isolation. You still need to have those physical meetings if you can. Now we go down to trust. Now, imagine you have really good communication, a really good connection with your team. This is the time that you are able to build trust in your team. It also, it's like a funnel. Right. So with trust, you always assume good intent. And I think this is where it comes. It boils down with most managers. That's why they're so hesitant to go remote because the trust within their team is very low. I don't know if you'll be able to finish this project in time. I don't know if the quality of your of your work is going to be as good as it would be if you were in in the office with me, you know, right beside here with us, you know, where you can access all of your the resources with you and your team members. But assume, assuming good intent means that you trust that person that they will do the best that they could with the resources that they've been provided. Or when it comes to communication, if there was a misunderstanding, you assume that the intention of the other person is good and not to harm or to offend anyone. And with this in mind, it changes how you see people. You change, it changes how you see your team as well. It's like you're rowing you know, in the same direction. It's the same boat and you should be rowing in the same direction. And you need to communicate this with your team. As a leader, you need to communicate this you know, within your team. And then learn empathy. So I think this almost every <laughs> manager already knows this. <laughs> so you need to be empathic. Like you, you may not be able to relate to what your team members are experiencing, but you can empathize how difficult it is or how, how hard, um, you know, what they might be going, going through or let's just say something happens in their family or the project that they've received is something more difficult than they've expected. Then for you, you, even though you cannot relate, you need to be empathetic about it and try to help them as much as you could. Um, and then lead by example. Of course, this is very self-explanatory if you say that. Let's use Slack for communication, Slack or for chat. Right, for a synchronous uh, chat, we will only use uh, Slack. Then you shouldn't be uh, texting people in WhatsApp, in Facebook, and all over the place because then it will confuse everyone. Uh, you should lead by example. If you say that you will only use this tool for this particular task, the very first person who is supposed to follow that is you as the manager. Uh, and I think most managers probably um, should should be conscious about this, um, that you the people that are following you, see, you know, reflects themselves. And if you're not doing what you said that you will be doing, 
why should they follow you? You're the leader, right? So you need to lead by example. And then learn which type of leadership is the right one for you. So there, we have different types of um, leadership style. So you have autocratic leaders, charismatic, transformational, delegative, transactional, supportive, democratic. It's not, you know, it, different leaders will have different styles that works for them well and works for, the, for their team well. And for you to be able to build that trust and to work effectively with your team, it would be a good idea for you to, to find out, you know, what's your leadership style. And there's also the servant leadership um, philosophy, which is, which is really good. So, but, but it's important for you to, to, learn, to learn this. Now, how can I develop my career or working remotely? I think we spoke about this um, before. Usually, if you were a manager, you would also want to progress your career in how can I get promoted? How can I develop, uh, you know, to progress and become a, from a junior developer to a senior one to becoming the VP of engineering? Well, let's go back with how your manager that you as a manager you have responsibilities for your team members and i'm and i'm sure you also probably have your own manager right and so you can just apply this in different levels for you as a manager how can you help your team members develop their career right so you need to provide three things this are career coaching career mapping and feedbacks and assessments. And also on the sidelines, you can like introduce them to people and network and you know that kind of sort of thing, but it's something extra. But the three most important things are career coaching. And when you talk to them and ask them, what, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your plans for the future? It's important for, for you to open up this conversation before you even think about progression, because it's like you're going towards a certain direction, but you don't know which direction that is, right? So you talk to them and your manager also. Uh, just imagine if, you, if, it was, if it was you speaking with, with your higher superior. You should, you should um, discuss this with them. Uh, as the way that you are discussing it with your team members, that what are your plans for the future? And then you map it out. Okay, I want to become, let's just say, I want to become the VP of product. Um, what's the, how do I achieve this? How, wh what are the things that I need to qualify for this position? Do I need to, you know, take more courses? Do I need to, um, get an MBA? Do I need to get, you know, do, do I need to get some certain certifications? Do I need to speak to X number of events? You need to be able to determine this, or at least your company would most likely have an outline of what's required for certain positions before you can apply for them or qualify, you know, to apply for them. And then feedback and assessment. So once you already did the coaching, once you already did the mapping of your uh, career. Now, by the way, career mapping, if you want to get promoted, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same company. Your responsibility as a manager is to help your team members, you know, to lift them up, to groom them, to become successful themselves. And it doesn't need to be successful within the company. It could be outside the company. And you shouldn't prevent that from happening. If they do leave the company because they got a better offer somewhere else and it will improve them, their career, and it's aligned with their career map, you as a manager should be happy that that's happening because then you've groomed this teammate to become successful and they are following you know, the, their, their career map, the, whatever it is that they want to achieve. So as, as a manager, you should also be conscious about that. And like I said, feedback and assessment. So you need to, you would want to, to speak about these feedbacks and assessments during your one-on-one -on -one meetings. 
So you talk to them about what are your plans? How are you doing? How are, you know, how are things with, with your career? Is there anything that is blocking you that I can help you, you know, move out of your way to, you know, so you, so you can make, uh, so we can make it easier for you to do your job, to do your job. And basically that is it. Um, so the key takeaways are six things. To become an effective remote manager, you need to, effective managers communicates well, initiates connections, builds trust, provides and receives coaching, both from your team members and also from your managers, from your CEO probably, right? He has a career map for himself, herself, and also for the people that are under, the, under them and gives feedbacks and assessments. And uh, that is it. Don't be shy and say hi. You can connect with me in LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much, Jen. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have here some questions for you. Are you ready yeah. to answer them? Yes, go ahead, shoot. <laughs> okay, so the first one is, any tips on how to have the best one-on-ones? Ha, ah, very good question. You, you should have an agenda um, for me, at least for my one-on-ones, and this is what worked for my team, is that we usually have a updates, uh, burning fires, and roadblocks. So updates like, can you update me about yourself? Like, what are, you know, how's going on? You know, uh, do you have any trips planned recently? Or what are you doing this weekend? And those kinds of stuff, but very personal. And then you have the, the, the burning fires, like what is it like within the next 24 hours, what do we need to resolve? Like, what is it that I can help you? Is there anything that I can help you with to resolve whatever problem that it is that you are facing right now, right? If there's something that needs to be resolved within the next 24 hours, tell me so I can help you. And then the roadblocks is like what's preventing you from doing, you know, your goals or your plans and how can I help you with that? Yes, nice. Thank yeah. you so much for the tips. They are really, they are really important. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, yes. This one had a lot of thumbs up. To work remotely mm -hmm. requires some soft, soft skills that currently aren't so widespread. How to identify these skills and how to train people to become remote workers? Oh, very good. They should apply to work remote <laughs> mentorship program. <laughs> so we're teaching them soft skills. I think that that's, and this came up with in several conversations that we've had before. We're in a lot of the schools right now, the educational system, and even like after you go get out of, of school, when you go to to your job, they train you with the hard skills, how to become a designer, how to become a programmer, how to become the best lawyer, accountant, whatever, right? But the communication skills within those um, careers, they, we, we don't, we don't, we rarely talk about those things. And for us, it's a challenge because remote working relies a lot on the soft skills. And at the moment, there are very few institutions who actually offers this type of, of training, right? And that's why we existed because we wanted to provide this training and make it accessible for everybody. Like, look, hard, you know, technical skills are wonderful. They're great, but for you to be able to effectively um, work remotely, these are the soft skills that you need, you know, you need to, you learn communication, culture, uh, health and wellness and all that stuff. Thank you. Right. Next question. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, time zone is a problem when working remotely? Um, that's actually, well, if you're working asynchronously, time zones don't really matter a whole lot. Um, and, and for us, our team is located uh, in different time zones. So we have like California, European, in the Philippines, Australia, and they're very spread out. I wouldn't call it a problem, although we do have some challenges in setting up meetings. And that's why we are mindful when we are setting up meetings that you wouldn't want to set up a meeting at 
12 midnight somewhere else and you know that is consistent and every day um, you probably would want that only once a week right or once every two weeks because that's unhealthy for them to to do but if it's necessary then you will have to to book it but just being mindful about a synchron with with synchronous meetings resolves a lot of this problem and just shifting towards asynchronous communication resolves the, the time zone issue. Nice. <laughs> um, let's go to another question. How do those three pillars, communication, connection, and trust, connect with an organizational culture? How do you build a remote culture? That's a good question. Um, so for the remote, remote work culture, this is what we tell people. This, things that we teach right now, it's not solely just for remote work, okay? They make remote work possible. Remote work, uh, remote working or remote work, uh, distributed teams or remote work teams, right? Remote teams become wh wh what they are because one, their communication is really good. It doesn't matter, you know, wh where you are, if you are able to communicate with the people that you are working with, even if you're in the office, in the cafe, in the library, or at home, doesn't matter, right? If you have good connection with them, meaning that, and, and you trust them, it means that you are confident that this person will deliver the task that you said that you will deliver. I need this design by tomorrow, 12 noon. Can you do it? Yes, no, right? If you cannot do it, then you tell me so that we can give you more time. The remote culture is basically this whole thing, communicating well, trusting the person that they will be able to do what they said and assuming good intent if in case they were not able to do it, right? It doesn't mean like they couldn't do it. Oh, he cannot do it all the time anymore, right? I will never trust this person again. You'll never, you, you don't know what happened why they didn't, they were not able to do it, right? You need to communicate and assume that the intention was good. They did not intend not to submit it. And this is what cultivates the culture of remote work. It, it doesn't have to be remote. It can be applied in, in, a, in a regular setup. But if you have this, going remote is much easier. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think, I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, next question. This is also a good one. How do you deal with people in your team who are adamant about not collaborating and working solo with no touch base, more cumbersome with remote working? I see. That's actually, that, that does, we do have um, people who are more introverted, means that they don't want to be, they don't want to communicate all the time. I used to work with, with Russian developers, people from the Belarus, and, and they're like very cold, very like, can you do the hi good morning like <laughs> how's your day can you do this for me and the answer is just yes no no i didn't do it i need more time <laughs> it's like just the one sentence there is it's so cold and there's like the connection is is just not there right but eventually for for you as a manager i think you would need to identify these people and try to um, see how you can incorporate, like meet in the middle, right? Because for them to understand that working in a, rem in a remote setup requires certain things, you know, certain, it, it's not just we're only going to be adjusting to you. We are going to be meeting halfway and teammates to teammates, that might not be something that you can demand. But in, as a manager, you have the authority to reach out to them. That's why you need to initiate connection. One of the things that I mentioned, initiate the connection, ask them how they are. Well, you know, what are their challenges? How can you help them better? And once they understand that you're not just trying to ask what's the weather out there because it's just what's the weather out there, <laughs> you know, they would, they would be more open to communicating with you. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> that, yeah. that's, that's it, really. Um, another question I have for you. Virtual team activities. How do you maintain and enhance the employees' virtual engagement during team activities? 
huh. this is one of the, the main challenges because I think so there is this app called or like a an integration in in slack called donut donut is um a bot that matches you up with people randomly within your slack community so you can meet with them have coffee with them like have a virtual donut so to speak right and uh, eventually the participation of that at the very beginning is very high because oh this is pretty cool it's actually nice right and then eventually it plummets and becomes, it slowly becomes like a, a responsibility, like an obligation because it automatically matches you. And then like, oh, do I need to meet with this person again? <laughs> right? And so, or do I need to meet with somebody? I have so many things to do. Or do I need to attend to that yoga class? It's, uh, I, I don't really want to, right? But our, our suggestion is to make these things optional and to explain to your team members why you are doing it, or maybe try to incorporate it within your team meeting. Let's say, okay, this is our team meeting for today. We're gonna go uh, do some stretching, you know, the, I don't know, five minutes of stretching before you start your meeting, or you, you allocate a certain time to tell us like, show us your mug today, or show us your, it's, I, there's so, there's so many ways that you can do these things um but like i said make it optional but also explain it to your team members why you are doing this we're trying to replicate a certain area that we do not have right now and so we, we should make an effort to do it yeah that's nice show your yeah. mug show your pet show yeah your exactly <laughs> show your pet right <laughs> then i don't have a pet but i have my daughter it's like i have my human pet right here <laughs> Right. Uh, so, another question. We have a lot of questions, Jen. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, how, how do you know when your work is done for the day? Do you prioritize your work before work a set number of hours? It seems harder to stop when remote. Yes, that's actually... A, uh, somebody just reached out to me today about that, about um, productivity, organization, and basically turning yourself on and off, you know, when you're working remote. So one of the main things that we teach people first things that we teach teach people is about your daily routine your environment and your routine that means that when you wake up in the morning what do you do right okay and you wake up you take a bath you brush your teeth then you go to the office right that's how you turn on yourself on a regular setup you should do the same thing when you are in uh, you know, in a home office setup, you should still stay your routine. There was a meme about this, of like the guy holding <laughs> the shower curtain, it's like imitating that they were in the subway. Okay, maybe not to that extent, but you should still keep some of the things that you do in the morning, like getting up, putting, if you want to put makeup, you can put makeup on. Sometimes I wear heels at home just so that I, I don't forget how to wear heels, right? And then it's just, you you do what you need to do to, to turn, you know, the work mode, so to speak. So you dress up nice, you eat your breakfast, you have your coffee, and then you go to your workstation. You should always have a workstation where it's dedicated for you to work. The same thing when you go to turn off for the day. For me personally, this was one of the most difficult things that I had to like establish like boundaries with myself um, that I, I, could, I could work up until 2 a.m. and not notice especially when I'm designing, it's like it's four hours fly by, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, but try to set a time when you would end work for the day, right? So you say, I will you know, keep working up until 8 p.m. And you try to finish everything at 8 p.m. And this, this is what I tell my, my teammates, the company will not burn down if you do not submit this, <laughs> or if you do not finish this task today, okay? There will always going to be a task tomorrow, so you don't have to worry. But if in case this is like business impacting and it really needs to be delivered, that's the exception. The, but every day it's like, look, stop working, it's 8 p.m., right? Or like, what the fuck is it? Why, why are you still working? Go have dinner, go take a walk. 
something, but you need to establish that boundary with yourself. That's the hardest thing, you know, for you to tell yourself like, oh, I'm so much in the zone. I just want to go and continue. You need to, otherwise it's going to be a bad habit. So you have to establish it. You, so you, you close all of the windows in your, uh, in your computer, you, you know, close it, you take a walk, you change clothes, you pretend as if you're going home, you know, from the office and that's how you turn off. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I think we still have time for one more question. Right. Um, when, taking a, uh, when talking about remote management, it's easy to think directly on your direct reports, but how about managing our manager? What should be done differently? Ah, that's a, that's a good question. So because um, culturally, well, I guess not culturally, because it's like very, very, it's universal now. There is low trust when it comes to manager. And this is why we're trying to educate them. Your man, the managers, the pre-COVID <laughs> were so hard, you know, on, on not doing remote work, right? They don't like the idea. It's like they're so against it. And, and this is why th th that question probably came, like, how, how, do you, how do you manage your manager? The thing is you need to cultivate um, the, the trust part, the communication part, to have an environment that you can openly give feedback to your manager, right? And also, if, if you do not have this established though, which is, you know, in some cases you don't have, you can try to talk with, with uh, your manager on one on your one-on-ones and just communicate to them or tell them I want to give feedback about how we are working this is nothing personal you know and this is th this doesn't mean that you're a bad manager or you're a bad person it's just that there is something wrong with the way we are working and I want to address that it does you don't have to have authority to do this you don't have to be a CEO or you don't you can be just a regular employee talking with your manager and opening up to them and telling them, this is my honest opinion. This is not because I am mad or I want to hurt anybody, but this is the situation that we have right now. And I care about this company. I care about this team and I want to resolve it. How do we resolve it? And then you take it from there. Nice. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, you said there should only be one source of truth in communication. Does it mean we should only use one platform to communicate with employees? Um, so the single source, the single source of truth, actually has something to do with uh, the company documentation or your your handbook. This is where all of your processes are are documented or saved. You know, and whenever you know let's just say, oh, it was Rita who usually processes the finance or the payroll. Oh, but now it's, you know, it's Joanna. It's a, the, the single source of truth will tell you who needs to process what, right? So that's the single source of truth. Communication, however, you need to, you need to streamline your communication in terms of if we're going to do video chat, it's, it should be Zoom. It shouldn't be Zoom, whereby WebEx, you know, or WhatsApp video call. No, for you to, this is just to ease, you know, the communication and the decision making of the people. Video call, Zoom. Chat, Slack. Uh, emails, and it's the company emails. It's just to simplify things. You, of course, if you know this person personally and you want to send them a personal message, go use whatever. But if it's communication within the company, those platforms need to be named. Thank you so much, Chun. Uh, I think we will wrap up our questions here. Thank you so much to, to everyone that is watching and also did some questions. Uh, it was a really interesting talk and thank you so much for your availability to be here with us. We are now going to have a break sponsored by TBLX and I would like to see you all here back at 6 p.m. Okay, thank all you right. so much. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Bye. Bye-bye.
Hi everyone and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break, that you enjoy our past talks and you are ready for our last talk of the day with Sara Gurjão. Today we have here Sara Gurjão with us. She is the HR and Talent Manager at TVLX and she's also a professional coach. She accumulates more than eight years of experience, six of those working in the IT ecosystem. With a background in psychology and the coaching certification, at Sarah's core values are people's happiness and motivation, and she approaches her work with a people-first mindset. Working at TBLX allows her to fulfill that goal since the company has a meaningful impact in the sustainable future of transportation. Data is a fuel that drives it, but people are the ones making it possible. Today, Sarah is here with us to talk about the remote work in times of crisis and how to keep a sustainable work-life balance and protect your mental health. Because this is not, not just remote work. We are working from home during a pandemic. Regardless if people were already used to remote work or if they're working in an office dynamic, the current situation we are living forced everyone to quickly adapt to unexpected and new reality with a worldwide health crisis as its backdrop. In this talk, Sarah will discuss how TBLX transition to a full remote setting, the impacts on the mental health brought by this sudden change and uncertainty, the need to create a new normal, and we'll wrap up with a live coaching session open to the audience. Sara, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Oh, I was almost forgetting. We need our silly peak. Are you ready for our silly peak? I don't know what that means, but yes. <laughs> It's our icebreaker. We're just having a silly peek, the both of us, so then we can gather all the pictures from all the speakers. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It was really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the stage is yours. <laughs> okay, so... Thank you, uh, Joanna, for presenting our talk and thank you, FutureWorks, for this opportunity. So uh, I always dreamt about being a YouTuber uh, and now I'm really nervous, uh, so <laughs> wish me luck. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, what Joanna said is true. Uh, I'm going to start my screen sharing right now. Let's go. Please tell me if you are watching this, my friends on the chat. Okay, perfect. So as Joanna was saying, um, we are presenting and we are talking about today um, remote working in times of crisis. Um, how to keep a sustainable work-life balance and protect your mental health. Actually, um, I, I, I have a, like a subtitle, uh, The New Normal, Keeping Sanity During a Remote Pandemic. This is ac actually what I'm going to address, but first uh, I would like to brief you a little bit about myself. Wow, yes. So my name is Sara Gurjão. Uh, I am an HR and talent expert at TBLX. And uh, well, I have some things here that um, are on the, on the screen. Uh, basically, I have a background in psychology. I have uh, coaching and NPL certification. And uh, the thing that I value most is happiness and people motivation. Um, and I have a people first mindset. I have eight years of experience in the IT field in HR and recruitment. And um, I would like to use that in, in our advantage today uh, to talk a little bit about our experience during this remote crisis and what we learned during this time and what we could use that could help you also um, in your companies and in your day to day. So first of all, like who we are, who is TBLX, where, they, where do they come from? Uh, you saw us uh, in a few videos that passed. So we are a startup within the corporate. We belong like we are um, incubated uh, um, by Daimler. Um, 
specifically, specifically by Daimler trucks and buses. We are a software company uh, and we unlock mobility patterns. We deliver data-driven solutions and we are focused on big data, AI and connectivity, specifically for e-mobility services, which means um, sustainable um, mobility solutions. But why is this relevant in the world of today? So basically, if we focus on what is happening to us today in this remote pandemic, uh, if we think about uh, the vehicles that are out there, they are even more uh, important, the trucks and buses units and vehicles, than they were, they, they became more re relevant to us uh, than they were like in the, in the before COVID, let's say. Uh, the trucks and, and buses, uh, specifically the trucks, they, they deliver uh, goods, medicine, food uh, to our homes uh, and to the hospitals. They keep the world moving. Uh, so we are responsible for keeping the world connected and moving. Trucks and buses actually keep the world moving uh, right now. Um, so the the software that we are building is also responsible for that connectivity and that uh, connectedness so let me tell you a little bit about our experience on going fully remote because we had first a, a, a remote friendly um, vibe and, and a culture and then we transitioned from one day to another to a remote first uh, approach uh, so for us, it was, I can say, easier to do that transition because we were used to having um, a shared uh, remote uh, office, like um, a shared uh, locations. So we have uh, offices, uh, Daimler has offices in the United States, Europe, Japan, India. Uh, so we were used to communicating and having teams operating in several locations. So. Uh, we were comfortable uh, with working with uh, different locations. So for us, uh, it was, let's say, easier uh, to adapt to distributed, distributed setting. Um, but uh, at TBLX, we really enjoyed being together and spending time with each other. And we shared uh, some rituals and uh, certain activities that we felt that kind of we missed when we turned uh, into this remote setting. Wow. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, what happened was we transitioned from, like I said, from one day to, to another, like basically on, on Thursday, uh, we, we sent a, a memo uh, saying uh, from Monday onwards, everyone will be working remotely like we act prior to the, to the indication and the regulations of the government. And we protected our employees regarding this pandemic um, situation. So what we did was we, we started by reading uh, all uh, the important for us, uh, the gurus of remote working like GitLab, uh, Equal Experts, uh, Toggle and Spotify. Uh, so we, based on, on what they said uh, and what worked for them uh, in the past, because they, they are used to working remotely, uh, no matter the situation, we read a lot uh, on, on what their guidelines said, and we uh, got inspired by them and tried to create our own uh, remote uh, culture. Uh, of course, uh, there was a lot of information uh, on the internet, like very quickly everyone had their um, first uh, uh, 10 amazing tips on how to quickly transition into a remote setting uh, of course have a dedicated workspace use to do list, to do lists deal with distractions learn from your experience take breaks don't lose touch with your friends make working comfortable set goals deal with being disconnected and cut yourself some slack. Yes, yes, yes. These are um, some obvious remote uh, working practices like no shit Sherlock. 
Um, and we didn't want to go into the obvious way, of course. These are uh, some full tips, uh, but they are out there and everyone is sharing something about remote work every day. There's another to-do list, another 10 best practices. My company is better than yours, than yours on remote working. And we wanted to create the thing that uh, met um, our reality. So by reading all of this, uh, we came to the conclusion, like, how are we going to put this into practice? How are we going to translate all of this into the reality that we are living in right now? So we came to the conclusion that it's all about sustainability. It's all about balance. There is no quick fix uh, in the world that we are living today. Uh, and we have to first uh, surrender to the reality that we are living in. And there was something that I was reading uh, the other day that the thing you resist persists. So you have to really acknowledge that we are living in an unprecedented um, stage. Uh, we've never experienced this before. Um, and we have to be aware that this reality is something that is going to stay stick with us. Well, at least uh, right now we know that uh, we are, we hope that this will end. This will end somehow soon, but we cannot make, uh, be sure. So, and we knew that uh, we would have to stay in this situation for a while uh, and we had to be prepared for it. So we had to find our balance, uh, hence the picture, um, to live with this situation. So one thing that, that we, we really uh, understood was that we couldn't take uh, anything for granted anymore. Uh, we were forced into this situation um, of remote working during a pandemic. Uh, we were jumping into a new reality without a parachute and uh, finding ourselves in this new normal uh, situation. And um, we were planning on a life that we had to put on hold. Like all of the things that we have had planned for, like if, if people had a, wed a wedding planned, if people had uh, par uh, tickets for a concert, if, if we had a summer party planned, if you had a kindergarten paid for for your kids, you had to put everything on hold and embrace, accept this new reality and find your own balance uh, when living in this new reality. So accepting this makes it harder for the human brain because for us humans, it's, um, in, it's hard to live with, uh, with uncertainty. It's hard to deal with this anxious thought, thought, and it's hard to change routines. So in this setting, um, it's even more um, permanent to talk about mental health. And that's why I wanted to, to address this subject. It's a hot topic. And it's been talked about uh, for, for, for a while now, but it seems, it seems like people uh, usually um, neglect this subject. And um, from uh, an HR point of view, this is even more important um, because we want to pay attention to this subject. And why? Why is mental health an important subject? Well, uh, first of all, it impacts your overall well-being. So uh, when you're not okay, uh, when uh, your mental health is not uh, fit, uh, it will impact everything else on yourself. So it will lower your immune system. Study has shown that it will lower your immune system. It will maybe transform into physical pain. It will it will go into a spiral. Um, it has impacts on others. If you live uh, with another person, if you have kids at home, if you're not feeling okay, um, it will have impacts on others. 
and it should be respected. Uh, this subject is of importance and people should um, understand that this shouldn't go under the radar, like, oh, this person is anxious. Uh, okay, this is just anxiety. Oh, this person is not dealing with the, the, the COVID subject that well. It will pass. Oh, it's just, a, uh, just the impact of having kids at home or whatever excuse. Uh, it should be addressed and it should be respected. Um, and it's, uh, it is as valid as physical health. So if you break a leg or if you break an arm or, or uh, you're not fit to work, why, if you, if, why it's not the same thing when you're feeling anxious or down or depressed or, or if you feel like you can turn into a red flag in, in, a, in a company, if you're, if you're feeling down, why is this not important? You should speak up. You should have a safety space, a safe, psychological environment where you can talk about this thing. Of course, it should not be ignored. And since it's not visible, like you're breaking something, you, you have uh, something on your face that it's broken, is visible. But if you are feeling anxious, nervous, uh, not okay for some reason, it's not visible unless uh, it, it, it's very um, de developed, unless you communicate. So in this setting where we are working remotely and we are not together every day um, and you cannot foresee, okay, I, I enter a, an office space and I saw that you are not, you're not your, your best self today. What's going on? In this case, you are alone at home or you are at home, not alone, but with someone else and you feel that you're not your best self, you should communicate. And we, as a company, we have that, that we are, have a, an open environment where we, we share those things. So it needs empathy to assess how others are feeling. And uh, it's important to have that. So transitioning here, uh, a thing that uh, I don't know if, uh, so it's, since I've studied psychology, this is something that I studied very early on uh, in university, is that uh, attachment theory. So uh, there are uh, several numbers of studies that show us that attachment and human connection is innate. So natural selection has find a way to pass this into our genes. And um, so attachment uh, is like something as connected, as, as inherent to us as fear. If you find a, a spider and you run away, it's something as innate as that. So Bowlby and Harlow, Lawrence, they, they've done a lot of studies with monkeys and with uh, other animals um, that shows that you need uh, human bonding, uh, or you need, in this case, the animals, uh, physical touch uh, to develop yourself as a your to your full potential. So, right now we are experiencing something that is not um, normal. Okay, this is the new normal, as I said. So, you should be aware that it's normal. It's okay to long for this human connection. It's okay to feel sad because you are not able to hug. You're not able to be with your friends, with your coworkers, with your family members. And this can have an impact uh, on you. You shouldn't uh, criticize yourself and judge yourself because this is normal, like you were born with these feelings, like you should respect yourself. The other day I was scrolling through um, LinkedIn and um, I, was, I, 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 I saw this and uh, Scott, if you are here, hello, thank you for inspiring me. Uh, I saw this post like quarantine work is definitely not the same as remote work and June was uh, talking about this in the previous talk. 
This guy says, I've been working remotely with success for 13 years. And uh, now I've been, uh, I've never been close to, to burnout, but now I've been quarantined for over a month and I've been feeling horrible. So take care of yourselves, folks, really. And this post got a lot of uh, likes, shares and comments. And in the, in the comment section, uh, I found some coping mechanisms being shared. Uh, I found some uh, other colleagues, colleagues sharing the same feeling. And this really uh, inspired me because, for instance, for me, uh, as an individual, uh, I've been, I found like the, the, the basic tips of keeping a safe uh, remote environment, even during quarantine, like a separate uh, workspace from my uh, leisure space, uh, being able to start at X time and finish my day at X time, remote, uh, respect my times of work, doing physical exercise, yoga, meditation, all that jazz. For me, it worked. Uh, but for other people, it really didn't work and they are struggling. They have kids at home. They have other realities. And we shouldn't force what uh, our beliefs or other things that work for us on other people. Um, and some days I wake up pretty uh, upset with the reality that we were forced into. That's why I really understood this quote as well. Uh, I could see uh, through his eyes what, what's going on with him. And that's why I, I wanted also to share another quote from someone that inspired a lot of, uh, a lot of gurus on the self-development uh, route, which is this guy, Tony Robbins. And this guy says, the quality of your life is a direct proportion, proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably deal with. Well, right now we are dealing with a huge, a huge amount of uncertainty. And how is your quality of life coping with this? And some people that are more control driven, uh, more certainty driven, um, they're not coping really well. For other people that uh, can deal better with uncertainty, they've found coping mechanisms that work for them and they can adapt. So I would like you to think a little bit about this quote and um, see if there's a connection to your quality of life or your happiness and the amount of uncertainty that you can comfortably deal with. Understand that this, if this resonates or not with you. So uh, the other day also I was uh, talking with a friend about this uh, uh, exact subject and since she's, she doesn't work in, um, in a software house, the, the, the adaptation to uh, a remote setting was uh, harder. Uh, I, I'm assuming that working uh, in a tech hub is easier to transition into a remote setting than other realities. This is my assumption uh, because this is a reality that I live in. And with this framework in mind, uh, she told me that uh, at least for her and the company that she works in, it's been harder. Some people have, have been laid off and she's trying um, to keep people connected. She was coming with some questions and I thought that I would and share some questions with you now and some uh, mechanisms that help me and uh, also helped us at TBLX to overcome some struggles. So this will be some kind of a lessons learned here. Okay. You have to give me a second to be very fast. Okay, so the first thing was, how do you keep people connected? 
Well, uh, this is uh, the million dollar question. Everyone seems to be asking this, this question. Um, and the, uh, the answer is uh, over communicate, like keep communication at flow. Uh, it's important to keep communicating with your teams. Um, for us, uh, by, uh, as the research has shown as well, uh, it's important to have face-to-face -face, uh, video calls with your teams. For instance, uh, other teams that didn't have dailies, we implemented them. Um, we have um, a, a Slack slash other type of communication channel where we uh, communicate often. We have channels dedicated to a remote COVID uh, situation. We also send um, a newsletter called TVLX newsletter. Uh, we have a remote lunch uh, where we have lunch together uh, once a week. It's voluntarily. People don't have to attend our events, but people usually like to uh, because it's a way they can keep connected and they can talk about during lunch other things not related to work. Um, here's the newsletter. And also we have a quiz, uh, culture quiz. I know all, a lot of companies are implementing this uh, and it's a way to keep the fun going. Uh, we had uh, board games, uh, physical, a physical space where we did some uh, activities, some gaming. And now that we are not um, allowed to do that face to face, we decided to implement a quiz. And then we shared some yoga sessions, uh, which uh, we failed tremendously. Like we had three people joining, but the intention is what counts. So we have also to adapt to our target group. Uh, maybe software engineers didn't like the, the yoga sessions. We did the assessment afterwards. Uh, we are going to also ask for feedback on all, all of our initiatives and maintain the ones that work best. And we are also wanting to keep people connected by asking for suggestions and wanting people to be part of this uh, new reality. And like I said, everything is voluntarily. Uh, they don't need to participate. Um, so if they want, they can. Uh, the, the, the end goal here is to keep people uh, connected, uh, give people time to chat outside of work, try to uh, keep people active. This was a failure <laughs> with the yoga session, uh, but we shared some links and if they want to do it by themselves, they, they are free to do so. Um, create fun moments with the quiz and also, as I said, over communicate, have channels uh, on our communication tool and share the newsletter. This is what works for what worked for us. Uh, there are other things that might work for your company, uh, but it's also about asking away what 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 you want, what what is working for you. Here, the question on how to protect uh, mental health of your of employees who live by themselves. This can be a tricky one um, because it's really important uh, to. To be to speak out um, during this this situation because if uh, as I said we are at home uh, we are isolate, isolated so the first thing you have to do is uh, have a, a safe space and a safe a safe environment where you, where you feel uh, you have the ability or the possibility to to communicate freely about what's going on so. From our end, uh, in terms of, of the HR and people department, uh, what we did is uh, we explicitly said that this, this was a, um, a time where um, we had a safe environment and we wanted to raise awareness about this topic. So if people uh, felt the need to have some one-on-ones, some coaching sessions, um, 
we were free to provide them. Uh, so also uh, we reached out more often. Um, so because um, this is also something that is in, in our DNA, um, we decided to uh, create some catch-up 30-minute sessions uh, with, uh, with random people uh, and see how, how was they, their day going, how, how are they dealing with the situation. Um, we, we are not responsible of protecting the mental health of, of, of our employees, but we can do our part to make sure that uh, we stay connected. We provided some uh, tools like uh, meditation tools and also some links for um, mental advisory. Um, but it's the only thing uh, we can do uh, as a company. Um, it's, pro it's provide some, um, some guidance through these times. Here, how do you manage employees with children? Um, well, uh, we don't manage employees with children. We praise them. We are doing, you are doing a terrific job. Uh, me, myself, I don't have kids yet. Uh, so I can only imagine uh, the multitask. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. So I would say he, here what we did is like we, we have uh, huge flexibility. Um, we have uh, a, a space where uh, people log in their time. Um, they, we have a space for uh, COVID um, family uh, time where people say, okay, now I'm, I'm uh, dedicated uh, to family support. Uh, I, I have to take my, uh, teach my kids something. This is uh, time dedicated to homeschool. So we have a transparent culture, a trusted, a trustful and transparent culture. So uh, we give our employees uh, the freedom to manage their time and we trust that they will do their, the best they can uh, during this situation. Like I said, this is an in, uh, unprecedented situation and we have to respect everyone's limits and um, we have to safeguard their mental health, as I said. Okay, so how do you help people deal with the uncertainty of this situation? As I said, um, we cannot uh, promise uh, on how, or um, we cannot uh, commit to how this will end. The thing that we can do is give uh, frequent updates uh, on the progress, looking to the government statements and, and, and overall uh, um, our mother company's updates talk day by day and rather than trying to predict the, the unpredictable and give room uh, for Q and A. So we have time for uh, people where they can talk freely about what's bothering them. Um, and we show vulnerability. Uh, we are not strict. Uh, we, when we don't know, when we are anxious, when we are tired of the situation, we express that we are humans too. So um, we don't expect um, people to, under to live in this situation like, okay, this will go by very fast and we expect to, to follow every deadline. It will be amazing. Uh, we'll go back to normal. We don't have this type of approach and I think this will serve no one. So the purpose of, of communication is uh, in fact showing that we are human too. Uh, we are also struggling with this situation and um, we are going through this as a, as a group, as, as, a, as a whole, as a team. Okay, this is a fun one. Uh, how do you guide someone that is struggling to, perf struggling to perform during these times? So, First of all, um, this this can be can be hard because um, if they if if uh, like advice to management, if someone is struggling to perform, like I said, transparent communication is is the key. Um, align expectations with that person, uh, and also work as a team. If the person raises a flag that they are not doing okay, they they are struggling with the deadlines or with the commitments or with the 
with everything that they need to manage during this time uh, at home, um, a team must come to the rescue. Uh, this is our approach. Uh, and people that uh, usually don't step up might step up and might surprise you um, in order to fulfill uh, the, the requirement. Uh, and usually what we say is um, try to avoid um, unnecessary pressure uh, of deadlines and so on. We, we are dealing with a lot of pressure like the, the overperforming performance pressure that, that I feel uh, is uh, taking us by storm. Like everyone needs to be super productive because uh, doing remote work, you, there are some people saying that they're feeling super productive. Take that edge off, cut yourself some slack. And um, of course, uh, as, as, a, as a company, you should uh, communicate that there are deadlines that need to, to be met, but there's a team behind you and uh, you should realign expectations and understand that this is, as I said, a time that we never lived before. This is the new normal, so we should realign on that. Did the relationships between the teams change? Well, um, it might be a reality. Uh, so we have to make a conscious effort to keep uh, the connection uh, within the teams. What we suggested was also have feedback sessions within the teams, like implementing something new. Um, and also the marketing and the communications teams uh, uh, came up with uh, TBLX Zoom Bingo. So because we work uh, in a squad scenario, um, you would easily, by the end of one week, would only communicate with your team. So they felt that it would be nicer to have an opportunity to talk with people from other teams, which we, we would do in an office setting. So imagine that this week I want to have a meeting with Carlos, uh, have a one-on-one, -on -one, have coffee with him, so I would uh, click on Carlos and then I, we would go to have a Zoom uh, meeting and have coffee, talk about the weather, talk about his yoga practice, something like that. And uh, then we could break up the silo that was uh, created by this remote setting. Uh, so this was something that people uh, tried to uh, begin to, to do and it was really fun. Uh, also, something that we could do uh, and that we tried also is uh, making visible that uh, this is a, a, a synchronous communication um, is a new reality so uh, within the team uh, not only not uh, only between the teams but also within your team you have to readapt to this new reality so someone that is always available that works next to you now has to pay attention to three kids at home, one cat, uh, one grandmother, and go shopping and has a wife or a husband. So a lot of things to take into consideration. So we have to respect that and also adapt as a team to this new dynamic. And now, um, if you have more questions, uh, I am here. Uh, available to share some insight uh, on my experience and what I've read, what I've learned. Um, and that's it. I'm opening the stage now. Uh, I hope this was uh, somehow insightful. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sara, for sharing your experience and all of your expertise. It was indeed insightful. We have here some questions for you. Are you ready for them? No. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> the first one is, currently we are going through a public health crisis, then the economic one will hit us. Do you think we will have a public, a public mental health problem? Well, that's, that's an amazing, an amazing question. Um, well, instinctively, I would say yes, um, but no one will pay attention to it. So... Um, 
I would use the Maslow pyramid uh, to address this subject. So I don't know if uh, you are familiar with it. Uh, I don't know who asked this question. Can you tell me the name? I, I cannot see. Mm, I can tell you the name. He is Carlos Palminha. Okay. Hola, Carlos. So uh, I don't know if you know the Maslow pyramid. Uh, the Maslow pyramid talks about our basic needs and uh, certain needs that we need to have filled in order to progress into the, the pyramid, to the top of the pyramid. Uh, so I think the economic crisis that we will leave and um, will somehow uh, make us uh, focus on, on, on the, the, the top uh, level of the pyramid, like safety, uh, food, uh, and uh, basic needs um, that, of course, will affect deeply uh, mental health of everyone and that don't have the, the, those needs filled, and, um, but we'll have to address those needs first uh, in order to progress in the pyramid. I think that our government is not um, aware uh, of the impact that this crisis will have on the mental health of everyone. Um, so I think <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I decided to study psychology, I wanted to change the world, just to give a side note. And I saw that the world was not ready to be changed or to give the, uh, the right space or support to mental health. So then I changed again to another area uh, where my impact could have a, def a definite change. So I feel that now we are going to leave that again. So um, we won't have uh, free mental health support to people that need it, unfortunately. But that would be great if people can voluntarily give it. Yes, that would definitely be, be great. Uh, I have here another question for you. Um, how do you assess your employees' adaptation and mental health during this pandemic or even in a normal remote situation? Okay. Well, uh, as I said, we don't have uh, like a, a checklist if, there, if that even makes sense. Um, we have uh, random uh, catch-up sessions. Um, like I said, we, we didn't have in the past a remote uh, culture. We had a remote friendly culture where we normally would have one or two days remote work per week. Uh, so this uh, topic, uh, we try to keep a keep track of uh, our employees' motivation and satisfaction with one-on-ones um, and uh, like uh, 360 uh, feedback on uh, how, the, how everyone is doing. Uh, but we don't have a checklist on, uh, do you feel sad, uh, like a smiley uh, rating on how you feel today? That, that's something that uh, from, that's a good initiative like logging in into, into our uh, communication tool with a smiley writing of your uh, happiness level or motivation level, frustration level, could give, could give us some analytical insight on the mental health of everyone and the track. Um, we don't have anything implemented yet, uh, but that's something that we could think about in the future, that's for sure. I'm open Thank to you, suggestions. <laughs> uh, so if you have any suggestions, you can leave them on the, on the chat of this live stream. Sarah, then we'll see it. Um, Sarah, now we'll go to the last question, okay? Okay. Uh, how do you make sure employees are not being overloaded with meetings and are still able to have their own focus time? Okay, that's an, an amazing question because... Uh, well, at, at our company, uh, we struggled with meeting overload uh, for a while. Um, so right now we've been tracking uh, the meeting uh, versus uh, coding uh, time and other product 
productivity uh, measures uh, on a software that we use. And actually we saw that meeting time has, has decreased during remote situation, uh, so which is a good indicator. We, we asked around why do we feel that that might happen. Um, what people say is that um, they feel that they can be more focused during remote time when they are truly uh, uh, blocking their time, their calendar to work um, on a certain topic. They communicate that they don't want to be disturbed. And then they, uh, when they have a meeting, they are fully focused on that meeting. They have an agenda and they clear the topics. Um, and that, that's how it's been working for us. Um, go to a meeting with intention, ask yourself, is this meeting really necessary? Uh, can we do it over uh, chat communication? Can we do it over an email? Uh, if this meeting is really necessary, I will go with an agenda of topics to be addressed and then um, close this meeting. So avoiding the overload of meetings, uh, I would say if you feel that you're being overloaded with meetings, you should definitely raise a flag um, to management or to, to your teammates and say, guys, this is not working for me. I'm not, I'm not being productive. I feel that this meeting overload is driving me crazy. Um, so yeah, that's what I would suggest. But, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for answering our question. Thank you for being here. Um, your thank session you. was really, really good. Um, this was our last session for today. I want to I want to thank all the speakers, Sarah, June, and Scott that were here with us today. Also, I would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors, our main sponsor, Camera Municipal de Lisboa, our daily sponsor, Landing Jobs, our stream sponsor, Fidzai, and our break sponsors, OutSystems and TBLX. And last but not least, I want to thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoyed our remote working day, and I hope you are here tomorrow for our remote recruiting day. Thank you so much.